Good afternoon and welcome to Argonne National Laboratories Frontiers in Materials Manufacturing, Accelerating Scale-Up with AI. Just a few logistical notes before we get started. BlueJeans works best in the Chrome browser, so if you have connected using another browser, you may want to exit and reconnect with Chrome. Your microphone and camera were automatically turned off when you joined the webinar. If you have questions related to the technology of this webinar, for example, if you can't hear or see the presenters, use the moderator chat feature and a member of the Argonne team will help you troubleshoot. This private chat may be accessed by clicking the icon that looks like a talk bubble. Public group chat has been disabled for this event. Argonne does look forward to engaging with you during the webinar, however, so please ask questions throughout using the Q&A function which is the square icon labeled Q&A. You can use Q&A at any time to pose new questions or to upvote questions asked by other attendees. By upvoting or liking a question, those moderating the questions will be able to see which are most popular. Finally, this event offers closed captioning. On the left, lower left side of your screen is a button with a blue outline that is labeled CC. Click on that button and three moving dots will appear on the bottom of the center of your screen. That's where the closed captioning will appear. To turn off closed captioning, click the blue CC button again. Please note this feature is available only if you have logged on with your computer, not if you have joined via cell phone. Closed captioning is computer generated, so it may not display some names and other words correctly. One more note, as indicated when the broadcast began, today's session is being recorded and will be posted on anl.gov for later viewing. Once again, welcome to Accelerating Scale-Up with AI. Thank you all for joining the webinar. This is third in our series on Frontiers in Materials Manufacturing. We are focusing today on accelerating scale up uh, with OI, AI. Uh, my uh, name is Antanu Chaudhary. I am uh, the Director of Manufacturing Science and Engineering Program at Argonne National Lab. Uh, let me explain a little bit about the importance of AI uh, in scaling advanced materials. One thing we can probably all agree on is that our need for advancing domestic competitiveness of our industry. And this is very important for advanced materials, uh, for energy technologies, from advanced lithium ion batteries to new catalysts uh, to uh, solar materials. When you look at materials that we make today uh, in, in different fundamental science level, the materials we make are very small in quantity. When we try to scale them up, uh, we find that it is incredibly difficult process, both it costs a lot and costs a lot of time. AI, or artificial intelligence, is a great partner uh, in this process 
and we can accelerate the process uh, if we can harness the power of data, machine learning, and our fundamental science knowledge uh, combined with our high performance computing capabilities. At Argonne National Lab, uh, we have taken this integrated approach uh, for scaling up materials. Why scale up is very difficult. When you scale up materials in a manufacturing grade system, the properties of materials that you see in, when it is synthesized in small scale changes as the instrumentation changes, as the external condition changes, as the impurities and other things that are included in those material changes. That changes the device performance, and that's, a, uh, that's not a necessary change. Also, you want it to be manufactured in a sustainable way. You want to manufacture this, this in a process that is speedy and you have what you know about the process very well so that you know what is produced meets your quality standards. This is very important. That's why we embarked on developing capabilities that integrates data science, AI, and high performance computing in our scale up facility. We have a brand new scale up facility as you saw in our, as we showed in our video. It's called Materials Engineering Research Facility, MRF. And MRF uh, is now integrated with the data uh, to really uh, make this possible. Let me uh, introduce uh, today's uh, agenda. Uh, we have, uh, first we'll hear from three experts uh, from a little bit different perspective, uh, but this brings us to how we know the pu public private sectors can work together uh, to make the accelerating scale up using AI possible for advanced materials. Next, we'll have a panel discussion. Some more panelists will join, and we're going to discuss how these exciting possibilities of it, including AI in our manufacturing process and scale up of materials can help us be more competitive and develop uh, advanced materials and new products. Uh, then uh, we'll hear from uh, Paulina Richinkova from a business development side of Argonne Science and Technology Partnership and Outreach. She will tell us how to how you can work with Argonne as a company, as a partner. Uh, finally, uh, we kept the best part for the last. We'll have a virtual tour uh, where we will take you to Argonne's advanced photon source. Uh, we'll show you uh, capabilities in the MRF and how the data integration and integration of AI can help us accelerate faster. And then we'll go to our Argonne Leadership Computing Facility. First, we'll show you the tours of machines, and then uh, we'll show you our visualization and data analytics capabilities uh, integrated uh, with our capabilities in material scale up. Uh, so uh, with, with that, uh, I will uh, begin with our first speaker. Uh, let me introduce Christine Shaw. Uh, she's a pro program manager in the Department of Energies. Office of Science Advanced Scientific Computing Research. Uh, Christine, we are really looking forward to your welcome message and your remarks. Hello, everyone. I'm Christine Chalk. I'm with the um, Advanced Scientific Computing Research Program. I'm program manager for the Leadership Computing Facilities, and I'm very excited to be here to join you, um, to welcome you, to this um, webinar. It's, it's something that's very important to me personally, and of course, um, the facilities have, have an active role to play. Um, my first slide, please. The next one. <laughs> so why is the Department of Energy interested in advanced materials and AI? Um, AI, as, we, as many of you will know, is a, a vast space. Um, with significant investments across the government and the private sector, and it seems to be an ever-expanding um, array of applications. And DOE has a unique role in this, though, because we have a suite of large-scale scientific user facilities that are world-class, including the Advanced Photon Source, which you'll see later today, and the Argonne Leadership Computing Facility, which is one of a, an array of high-performance computing facilities across the country that the Department of Energy um, manages and including the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility Summit System, which is the fastest supercomputer in the United States. Um, so our niche, our unique contribution to AI is at the intersection of big data, big compute, and artificial intelligence at scale. And 
We also have mission challenges that require a lot of advanced materials. And many of these advanced materials are put into extreme environments, whether it's the walls of a tokamak or at the center of a particle accelerator's um, collision. Um, these materials are undergo significant conditions and are often custom made for us. And we rely on partnerships with the private sector to continue to advance these materials that we will eventually need in rather large quantities. Um, the DOE also has an advanced manufacturing program with a mission to catalyze R&D and to also push the adoption of R&D that the Department of Energy has supported um, into advanced manufacturing technologies um, to drive the U.S. economic competitiveness and also to, to improve our energy activity. And the, the new administration is particularly keen on this. So this is definitely going to continue and probably expand um, in, as we move forward. Next slide, please. Another reason why my program is particularly interested is um, our big project is the Exascale Computing Project. Um, we will this year be deploying the first Exascale system, certainly in the U.S. and quite possibly in the world. Um, and that will take computing to another level. And it will be a, a CPU-GPU hybrid, just like this current fastest system summit at Oak Ridge. And um, it has a lot of capabilities for AI that are just fundamentally um, beyond what you can do on, on, in the cloud or in other um, smaller scale systems. Next slide, please. We've also, as part of the Exascale Computing Project, been working with a, an array of applications across the government um, and DOE missions to make sure those applications are ready to make use of this Exascale capability. Um, it's 10 to the 19 flowing point operations per, per second. It's an, an amazing amount of compute power, but it also requires a great deal of orchestration to control and harness that computing of capability. So, Many of these um, explicitly involve materials design, but many of them implicitly do as well. And so there's a lot of um, code that we're developing. All of it is open sourced. It's, there's available both the GitHub repository and the Exascale site has a link to that. Um, also, um, DOE code is another site where you can find access to the open source codes that the DOE has been um, using and, and developed, including some, some AI um, codes that we're using and um, workflows that really know how to make good use of the high-performance computers. Next slide. So my program has these three large high-performance computing centers. Um, NERSC is in California at Berkeley, and that's mainly dedicated to Office of Science mission research. Um, but the two leadership computing facilities, the one here at Oregon that you'll see later today, and the one down at Oak Ridge, um, are open to everyone, all qualified researchers um, from industry, small business, academia, government, even international teams. Um, and they are available for high performance computing that requires that scale. So right now, um, Summit is a 200 petaflops, but we'll be upgrading to the Frontier system this year, which will be an exaflop. Um, it, it will be in, in testing and um, use for the Exascale computing applications um, for a while, but it will be available openly through our allocation programs. And um, it, you should, and, but it, it's going to take effort to get there. So um, partnering with, with the DOE labs is a great way to help you bridge that gap to that next, next generation of, of computers that are coming out this year. Next slide, please. Programs that also might be of interest to you, um, the DOE Advanced Manufacturing Program. Um, I think these slides will be available to you so you don't have to scribble down the URLs. Um, there's also, if you, and that's for applied materials and applied advanced manufacturing um, efforts. The Office of Science also has a basic research program in material science and engineering. Um, if your work is more in the basic area, um, we have programs in high performance computing for it manufacturing, for materials and applied energy. Um, for energy applications, um, you'll notice that the, the URL for that at the Livermore site is the same, and there's actually a, a several different programs there, and they help you to work with the national labs and to use, to use high-performance computing to advance your goals. We also have um, two leadership computing facility allocation programs. Um, Insight is for very large um, grand challenge problems, and ALCC is for sort of um, large to medium-sized um, challenges, um, and is a great way for industry to, to try and um, access the leadership computing facilities. 
I am also the program manager for the Oscar Leadership Computing Channel. Next slide, please. Oh, welcome and thank you. Um, I am happy to answer any questions that you might have. I very much appreciate you attending this webinar. Um, we have a lot of opportunities to, for partnering with, with the national labs and for helping you to achieve your goals to develop advanced materials that DOE will then be able to use for our mission challenges. So um, thank you, and I hope you enjoy the webinar. Oh, thank you, Christine. Uh, I want to do, make sure that everybody who wants to ask a question can use the Q&A uh, facility, to, and I will moderate the questions. Uh, I, will, I have a question uh, for you, Christine. Um, I know that, um, you know, in, people are a little bit reticent about how to access these resources, especially small companies uh, are, do not have the resources to really access uh, these resources. Can you tell me a little bit about small companies and medium, large size company, how they can work with uh, these facilities a, li a little bit more uh, so that, uh, you know, companies and entrepreneurs in our audience uh, can learn a little bit more about it. Yeah, there's actually an array of programs that could be useful to help companies of all sizes to partner with Department of Energy. Um, starting with the Small Business Innovative Research Program, um, we invest in small companies that are doing um, research um, in a variety, a large number of topics in energy and materials and in computing and in um, particularly in, in computing that leverages high performance computing because that is our primary interest. Um, I have a topic this year in the small in the SBIR call um, in developing code that would make it easier for industry to access um, the facilities. So I'm trying to find small businesses that want to take code that DOE has already developed and productize it because one of the things that the bigger companies have told us is that they don't particularly like open source code as much as something that they can work with a partner on and make sure that it's meeting their needs and it's certified and everything. So there's that. The, um, there's also the Advanced Manufacturing Program at DOE. There's also um, the HPC4. So for companies that are already pretty HPC savvy and want to partner with the national labs, those, those are a great way to, to get in. But there's also one-on-one um, -on -one CRADAs. They're, they're cooperative research and development agreements. And um, that it's a way that a company can partner with the national lab and target a particular problem that they're trying to, to overcome. Um, in addition, the leadership computing facilities both have um, industrial outreach centers. Um, David Martin, who you'll, you'll meet later, um, runs the Argonne Industrial Outreach Center and Susie Titchener at Oak Ridge National Lab. They have websites on how to access them. There's another allocation program called Director's Discretionary where, where companies can sort of try something out and see if it scales and, and get access to these supercomputers for something small as a sort of a trial. So there's lots of opportunities. There's also some wonderful webinars and hackathons and um, training that all three of the Oscar supercomputing facilities offer on a regular basis. They're very popular, so when, when you see them, get in quick. Um, but they're also extremely effective. Um, we just had a story where um, General Electric was very, very happy with their experience in using the Oak Ridge Hackathon to help them um, port their code so that it could take better advantage of the GPUs on the Summit system. Excellent, thank you. I have one audience question, just a quick one, uh, is that if you can comment a little bit on uh, role of your program in the COVID impact on the nation. Oh, the, actually, the Department of Energy has um, been very active in contributing to responding to the COVID. Um, the CARES Act provided almost $100 million to the Office of Science, um, which helped us to enable the National Virtual Biology Lab, which um, there's a slide deck if you Google it, um, uh, and with all the success stories of where we partnered with, with companies to help them to um, develop PPE um, more rapidly. We, we worked with um, you know, some of the drug manufacturers to, to test different things. And also the HPC facilities were able to um, stand up a little bit of dedicated hardware that had unique features that biological researchers prefer, like um, fat memory nodes. And um, we were able to provide millions of hours um, to researchers in vaccine development, drug development, um, epidemiology, um, through this HPC consortium that we set up. Um, and it, it's been very, very effective. We've, we've got some 
good results coming out of it. It's still going on. You can still access the HPC facilities or partner with the national labs if you have a COVID project that you think will be impactful. They're all open to all qualified researchers, but and through a peer reviewed process. So, um, and that's still ongoing. And because we're still, unfortunately, dealing with the challenges of this pandemic. Thank you, Christine. Appreciate your comments and remarks and answers to questions. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for setting up the webinar. <laughs> thank you. Uh, now I'm delighted Bryce Mirdig, uh, the founder and chief science officer of Citrine Informatics. Uh, Bryce uh, co-founded uh, Citrine Informatics in 2013 to apply data science, material science, and machine learning to the materials and chemical industry. And before that, Bryce earned his PhD in material science and engineering at Northwestern University. Uh, welcome, Bryce. Uh, please take it away. All right. Thanks. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, discussing these uh, very important topics with you all. Go ahead and get my slides up here. I'm hoping we can bring a, a unique perspective uh, to, to these questions around scale up and, and applications of AI to material science because, as you just heard, we're part of the software industry. We're uh, a company that sells materials informatics software to large uh, materials and chemicals companies. And the name of the game is all about uh, speed and agility. It's about getting uh, breakthrough new products to market faster than has ever been possible before. And that is, in our view, augmented, of course, by uh, data and AI. So I wanted to share a little bit more about our uh, vision for the for the future, and I'll do that by contrasting the way things work today conventionally with uh, an ideal future state. Uh, first, when we talk about what's going on at the bench top, the lab environment, uh, generally speaking, today scientists, scientists and engineers tend to plan their next experiments using intuition, chemical intuition. That can be very powerful, but I think we're also starting to see that it has limitations, especially when we need to go faster and faster than we've been able to do in the past. So we think in the future, it's going to be essential for the same scientists and engineers to leverage their domain knowledge alongside uh, data and AI uh, in order to, to develop better hypotheses and test them more efficiently. Uh, and of course, we also uh, think about integrating the constraints, the requirements of scale-up manufacturability earlier on in the R&D process. Now, when we zoom out one level and we talk about um, uh, R&D strategy and, and at, at the portfolio level when a company has a number of different projects they could undertake but they don't have the resources to do them all. The question is how do we uh, use data and AI to help them make winning bets, um, to help them uh, feel a little bit less like they're, they're sh uh, shooting in the dark when, when they know that um, these are very high risk, high reward projects. How can we lower the risk using, um, using AI? And then lastly, uh, at the sort of boardroom or executive level, uh, there, there's a lot of concern around um, uh, large siloed organizations. So how can we break down these walls? For example, that might exist between an R&D function and a manufacturing function. Uh, how can we make sure they're sharing data, sharing um, uh, well-vetted AI-based models that could be used again and again as assets in materials design? So I uh, wanted to summarize, at least in our view, some ways in which AI can impact materials and chemicals broadly. First, uh, you know, I've already mentioned this, this should be pretty obvious, but uh, faster product development, uh, and, and in doing that, it's essential that we um, solve scale-up uh, uh, problems faster than we've been able to do before. There's regulatory resilience. This is particularly important for environmental sustainability requirements. Uh, supply chain resilience. You know, uh, unfortunately, we've we've really seen this happen uh, in with the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, a large number of companies have experienced severe supply chain shocks. How could we think about, uh, for example, reformulating products quickly in order to be responsive to those um, unexpected changes? Uh, there is the issue of increased customer responsiveness. Uh, I think um, what we're going to see more and more in the future is the customers of materials and chemicals companies are going to ask for more and more highly customized solutions. They're going to be less satisfied with, with a company that says, here's our product uh, portfolio, pick one, or here's our product catalog, go ahead and pick one. And they're going to say, what can you tailor to our needs specifically? Uh, and that's, again, an area where data, AI, and scale-up are, are important. And then lastly, uh, cost optimization. How can we uh, minimize costs while maintaining performance, for example? So I'd like to share just uh, one uh, example application uh, of um, uh, AI and, and with particular relevance to scale up, which is the idea of implementing a closed loop laboratory. This is something we uh, work on and think about a lot at Citrine, uh, robotic automation, uh, ensuring sort of a data-driven feedback loop in the materials uh, research process. You can imagine that these um, automation capabilities are particularly valuable in helping us solve scale-up problems because, for example, 
uh, you could imagine um, asking these robotic systems to s solve increasingly more difficult or increasingly larger scale, let's say larger reactor volume um, synthesis optimization problems, uh, and then um, share data all the way along at these different uh, length and time scales. Uh, so we have um, had a project uh, to, to, to work on some of these questions with, uh, with uh, Slack just down the road from us. This is a, a DOE funded uh, program. You can see a, a schematic of the uh, architecture on the, on the left. The problem here is um, optimizing uh, synthesis recipes for nanoparticle, uh, uh, metal nanoparticle catalysts. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see a, a photograph of the actual apparatus. Uh, but again, this is an iterative uh, feedback loop where, um, uh, you know, the automated system is synthesizing some recipes, uh, characterizing the results, feeding that back into a, an AI-based model, retraining, uh, and then the, the model is suggesting uh, new experiments to run that are likely to be more successful. And one of the reasons why we like to talk about this example is because it's a, it's a case of um, multi-objective optimization. And this is universally a, a, a challenge for materials design uh, certainly, it's true when we talk about uh, implementing scale-up requirements early on in R&D, where you would say, okay, I have these five uh, property requirements that I, that I uh, have always known about. Now you're saying, okay, I have these additional five requirements, let's say, that come from uh, scale-up considerations or manufacturability considerations. Uh, we need to solve these high-dimensional optimization problems. This is a, um, a proof of concept of doing that in, in this sort of laboratory automation type environment. Uh, here we're looking at three properties. We want to, on the left-hand side, uh, minimize the width of the particle size distribution or achieve highly monodispersed particles. Uh, we have a particular target window in mind for these uh, the size of these nanoparticles. And then we want to uh, keep the particle scattering intensity above a certain floor. And here we use that as a, a proxy for the yield of, of the reaction. So that goes back to what I said before about um, implementing some, some ideas that relate to scale up in the, in the R&D process. Uh, and between the two vertical red lines on each uh, panel here are sort of the initial experiments that were run simply to generate training data for AI. And then to the right of the second uh, red bar, we turn on the optimizer so you can see the particle size distribution gets pushed down. That was uh, 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 one design objective. Then uh, to the optimizer attempts to satisfy the other constraints, which is to keep the particle radius in the, in the target window. You can see it pushes up towards the window. And then uh, it also attempts to keep the particle sc uh, scattering intensity above that floor. Uh, and you can see it does a good job of avoiding failed experiments. Uh, so again, this is the kind of uh, combination of materials informatics sort of software and, and AI model capabilities along with um, laboratory automation. Uh, that, that's going to be, I think, very very potent in helping us solve these uh, kinds of um, R&D and scale questions more quickly. So looking ahead, um, you know, we think about sort of applying model-driven approaches in manufacturing. One of the examples that comes to mind, at least for me right away, is uh, the virtual aluminum castings project at Ford. This is an integrated computational materials engineering approach where uh, the researchers were using um, models at multiple length and time scales uh, and sort of integrating them all together in the same design problem. And I, I'm, of course, a little bit partial to this example. It's, it was 15 years ago. Uh, but it remains one of the, the best examples, I think, of model-driven materials and, and process design. And of course, my PhD advisor was involved, so, um, so I do have a bit of a bias there. Uh, but I think it's, it's worth asking, given this was so successful at, at Ford Motor, um, how could we enable more customers or more uh, companies to use uh, data, AI, and physics-based models all together more routinely in their materials design and scale-up efforts? And there's some challenges associated with doing that. One, physics-based simulations tend to be computationally expensive. Um, so the question is, can we replace some of these simulations with an ML-based or AI-based surrogate? Um, it's not always obvious how the outputs of one simulation uh, line up with the inputs of another. Uh, so that's a, a challenge. Um, of course, we want to actually solve the inverse problem, which is given targets, give me, uh, you know, provide me with recipes that are likely to satisfy those targets. Uh, and AI makes it much easier to invert these models. And then lastly, of course, we might not have a good physics-based description for all the properties we're interested in. That might be especially true when we start to talk about scale-up manufacturability, where we, for example, could have a great deal of data from the manufacturing environment, but not we can't write down an equation that gave rise to the data. Uh, we can use AI in those cases. So we have this uh, sort of um, mental model of using uh, AI machine learning as multi-scale glue. Th these um, AI models are, are very effective at sort of integrating information, at uh, multi-fidelity information, multi-length scale information, simulations, experiments, even analytical theory, uh, bringing that all together in sort of one predictive framework uh, that is uh, sort of pointing all that information, all that signal, if you will, on solving the problem of interest to you. 
Um, so this is just a little cartoon example of, of doing that in the case of modeling for fatigue strength, but you can do it with your, um, your favorite properties of interest as well. So then to, to wrap up, just to summarize some uh, points about AI impact on material scale up. Um, so this is something you know, we can certainly say as, as uh, software vendors, materials informatics is being boy, uh, deployed broadly across industry now and scalability is a key requirement. Companies like you know, Ford in the example that I gave or certainly for Citrine's customers, um, they're not interested in just doing something once or just doing something at a few uh, gram scale uh, unless it can be made at, at large scale and sold to customers you know, by the train car, uh, it's, not, it's not interesting to them. Uh, you can use, uh, think about using software, sort of materials informatics infrastructure and AI models as connective tissue, like I showed in that schematic, um, to integrate all these different sources of information, some of which might come from a manufacturing context, some of which might come from an R&D context, for example. Uh, we can also think about using uh, uh, scale-up results, historical scale-up results, as additional uh, sources of training data for, um, to enable us to screen for candidates that are likely to scale well earlier in the R&D process to avoid the value of death when we try to scale. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we like to think about um, accelerating the uh, computationally expensive uh, physics-based models that we might use in a in manufacturing setting, for example, um, by uh, increasingly replacing those expensive evaluations with a, an AI-based surrogate. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll conclude. Thanks for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the discussion. Uh, thank you, Bryce. Uh, appreciate uh, your uh, inputs. I have a one quick question for you, if you if you uh, don't mind uh, picking around. Uh, so uh, for Citrine, uh, have you have it, have you seen that partnerships with the national labs uh, is important? Uh, but how do you see the small business and large business trying to integrate materials informatics uh, in a, in a large scale uh, ways uh, in their process? Uh, do you see some trends uh, that you can uh, answer? Yeah, well, you know, first of all, I'd say Citrine certainly um, very much appreciates the ability to collaborate with. Uh, the entire DOE national lab system, um, there's, I think it, it's, it's very complimentary, right? There's a reason why these public private partnerships often tend to work well. It's because everyone brings unique strengths to the table. Uh, in terms of uh, adoption of materials and informatics in, in industry, you know, we, we, when we talk about scale up, uh, of course, we, we can mean scaling the materials innovations, uh, but mm -hmm. there's also uh, the question of doing materials informatics at scale. So that's a whole other question for, for large companies, uh, for example, uh, you know, like, uh, like uh, Ford or some of the other uh, names you could think of. Um, it's, it's the same, same story where uh, doing a sort of single one-off uh, demonstration of model-driven design or, or AI-driven materials design, for example, isn't as interesting as how can we do this across the organization with thousands of people, you know, tens or hundreds of projects, uh, that brings its own set of challenges, for, and those are the kinds of things that we focus on a lot at Citrine. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, I will, uh, uh, thanks, Bryce, for, for your very helpful comments, and uh, you'll have some more questions during the panel discussion. Um, next, uh, we will go to uh, Christina Thomas, uh, who is a global R and R&D global process owner at uh, 3M. Christina has held many leadership positions within the company involving safety, security, strategic planning, and global application uh, development. Before joining 3M, uh, she received a PhD in chemical engineering from University of Massachusetts. Uh, Christina, we are thrilled that you could join us this afternoon. Uh, please take it away. Thank you, Santano. I'm, I'm, I'm truly inspiring, inspired already by the two speakers we have had before. Uh, Wow, one showing the possibilities of working with a great infrastructure that the Department of Energy has regarding AI. And then Citrine saying all the roles, all the pieces that they're putting together in collaboration with the whole ecosystem to make this happen. So uh, thank you. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to this forum. And I want to thank in particular Santana you for guiding me as we prepare this presentation. You know, speed, speed, speed. <laughs> exponential, exponential, exponential. Whether it's growth, whether it's data, whether it's change. Acceleration, acceleration, acceleration. Those are the times we live in. 
Those are the times I live in in, the, in industry. And it's truly about harnessing these digital technologies uh, in industry to be more competitive. Um, when I looked at, um, at industry, we need to achieve that speed to be a first to market. We need to accelerate development and scale up to be first to market. And we need to deliver solutions that matter to our users, to our customers, to our, um, uh, to the, to the world in front of this exponential change. But first, I would like, okay, mm. let's see how I pass this slide. It's not moving. Mm. Mm. Um, for some reason, no, it's not passing. Okay, now I'm back. <laughs> I, hope, I hope you are too back. It wasn't uh, moving the slide. I, I want to give you context on 3M, the industrial organization that I'm proud to be part of. You know, our vision is a 3M technology advancing every company. Our product enhancing every home, your home, our innovation improving every life, your life. And when I do it, this, many times people ask me, what's that innovation model and how does that happen? And it's quite simple to tell you the truth. It's this confluence between insights. AI has a big role to play in insights, whether it's from the market or whether it's from internal data. Is that a confluence with technology platforms that I will key more on that and this collaborative culture. And I think one thing that is going to come up here, how we accelerate that impact of AI to benefit all of us is that collaboration among all the parties. This is how 3M organizes our technology platforms in a periodic table. It is um, 51 technology platforms. In order to be in this uh, technology platform, we need to have a sizable business impact from that particular technology. And we also need to have world-class scientists, world-class experts in that technology. We have to have a sizable intellectual property portfolio, let's say patents, trade secrets. And we have to have manufacturing, manufacturing that is strong and that is placed in various locations. This periodic table has a portion that is very relevant to the topic of today, the digital technologies portion, whether it's data science and analytics, DS, whether it's software solutions, SS, whether it's computer vision, CV, modeling and simulation, MS, or uh, are all advanced robotics. All of these plays in this uh, ecosystem. Now, there is a particular laboratory within 3M that is a corporate research laboratory that has AI, the topic of today, as a, as a key uh, strategic platform. And as AI, they have then uh, developed expertise and will continue to learn more uh, from, from experts like uh, people attending this uh, event in machine learning, in deep learning, in computer vision, in time series analysis, material informatics, and generative adversarial uh, networks. All of that is in action today. Now, that action has translated into products, really products that are today are um, uh, benefiting many of us. I have two examples here that I will quickly go through. One is in digital dentistry with our clarity aligners and that the treatment, the treatment is especially designed for that patient and it takes uh, various uh, stages and those stages can be readjusted as it goes. So that's one case. And the second says is infiltration. We filtered smart filters and our app. Really here, now you can know when to change that filter, but it goes beyond that. It also tells you where you are. What is the air quality surrounding you? 
what is happening in the neighborhood uh, that you live uh, in. Very interesting applications. Now, we heard today about transforming materials design. AI is today transforming material design. It's a journey. We are in that journey. And as we go into that journey, we're building. We're building actually solutions. Material informatics. It's this idea of giving researchers data access, data visualization, predictive modeling, and that experimental automation, we just saw in practice in some of the slides uh, before, before us. Uh, let's see, lab automation and Internet of Things. I show you a product that is Internet of Things, this uh, filtration smart app. And this real time, this is the goal for all of us, this real time feasibility prediction that becomes routine, part of our normal day to day life. Uh, that's where we're going now. We also are thinking about scale up, are thinking about manufacturing, are thinking about optimal processing windows and uh, deep casual learning. That convergence between casual learning, deep learning, and reinforcement learning is being applied today to optimize processes that are that we have had for many years. And even after these many years of optimization and engineering principles, uh, DCL has been able to improve them even more to create a speed of, at a 10% increase. It is just fascinating. Now, for us leaders in AI, we need that we're always pondering how to accelerate this impact. We need to know that partnerships are essential, are key to those new insights and actions. Um, I showed two examples here from a collaboration with Argon National Lab and with uh, Professor Ian Foster's team under a crater, under a crater. And they are referring to optimization of manufacturing for non-woven materials, which is something and uh, materials that are used today in to protect many of our healthcare workers uh, during the pandemic. We also are looking at material design by tapping into the multiple, many, many data sets that we have gathered throughout the years uh, in our analytical lab and trying to ask questions to those images that were not asked 10 years ago and getting answers from those images that we would not have been able to think even 10 years ago. It is really fascinating in collaboration. We couldn't do it without the, the algorithms, without the thinking of, um, of the scientists in our, in our national lab. I have another example that is with Sandia, and it's regarding multi-physics approaches for the design of materials and the corresponding manufacturing processes of that material. It's in the area of new novel mat uh, energy materials. It's looking at passive solar cooling using metamaterial films. This is, this is fascinating. But before I also finish, I wanted to, to let you know how important it is also to train ourselves in this area, not just to uh, continue to create experts, but actually reach the people that did not grow up in the era of data sciences and artificial intelligence. Uh, with truly practical workshops. And CHIMAT is just one example that 3M has been able to tap into, the Center for Hierarchical Materials Design. Uh, CHIMAT has a very good outreach program. In fact, when I, when I went deep into that, they have, uh, they have outreach to high school students, to undergraduates, to, of course, graduate students doing their research and postdoc, but also to professionals. And that part of professional is where I got engaged with them. They actually have brought and have shared with the rest of us and are willing to train us and, um, and practice together these disruptive approaches for material design. That is also very important. I want to, I hope I have conveyed today the excitement that industry has for AI. And I look forward to the Q&A questions during the panel session. Thank you. 
thanks, Christina. Yeah, let me try to unshare. Uh, thank you so much. So um, now uh, I would like to move on to our panel discussion. Uh, it is moderated by uh, Yen Foster, who is Director of Argonne's Data Science and Learning Division, uh, also an Argonne Distinguished Fellow. Yen serves as Arthur Holy Compton Distinguished Service Professor at Computer Science Department in University of Chicago. Uh, Yen will uh, spend uh, the next half an hour or so with, uh, with the distinguished panelists uh, with that. Uh, let's uh, get started with our panel discussion. Uh, Yen, take it away. Greetings, everyone. I trust that you can uh, hear me and perhaps even see me, who knows, in this age. Um, so it's my pleasure to uh, host this uh, panel. Um, I'll just say a couple of words, you know, why I'm even here. Um, I'm not a material scientist, I'm a computer scientist, but at Argonne, uh, as well as the very strong uh, manufacturing program that you've already heard about, we also have a uh, 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 excellent um, computing uh, directorate, which includes uh, a data science and learning division that I head up, a uh, world-class high-performance computing facility, and uh, really outstanding uh, applied mathematicians and computer scientists. And we're all uh, deeply interested in this question of how data science and high-performance computing can be brought to bear on the goal of automating and accelerating discovery in, in manufacturing. For example, we're working closely with uh, people uh, working uh, in close collaboration of Santanu on uh, AI-driven discovery problems and battery materials. Uh, AI-driven discovery, uh, AI-driven methods used to choose the experiments and simulations that we will perform to identify promising materials. So great potential there, and we're very excited to be part of this panel. In any case, um, we're joined, well, I am joined today by four panelists. Uh, Bryce Meredith and Christina Thomas, you've already met. Uh, in addition, I'll uh, welcome now Kathleen O'Brien and Nicola Ferrier. Let me just say a few words about uh, each of them. Um, Dr. Kathleen O'Brien is from uh, Raytheon. She joined the Raytheon Technologies Research Center uh, just last year as a as senior director of the Intelligent Systems Department. Prior to this, she was with GE Research for 15 years, where she was the technical director for electric power and the director of the external program portfolio for energy and electrification. Dr. Nicola Ferrier, I'm fortunate to have as a colleague at Argonne. She's a senior computer scientist in the mathematics and computer science division. Uh, she leads programs in computer vision and robotics and other interesting uh, things. Uh, Dr. Ferrier was previously a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Wisconsin uh, in Madison. So welcome both of you to the panel. Um, if you have any introductory remarks you'd like to make, feel free to do so. Perhaps just say hello. Um, okay, on that... Uh, Note then perhaps I will move on to uh, the uh, to to the panel. So what we're going to do here is we're going to I'm, I've got a number of questions. I'm going to pose the uh, panelists. Uh, they will answer. Uh, I hope, um, and, and then we'll uh, we'll also be able to take uh, questions from the uh, from the audience. Uh, you can pose those, I believe, in the Q and A uh, component of of the. Um, conferencing uh, system. So first of all, um, well, Bryce, let's start with you, seeing as you sp spoke first. Um, we're interested in this question of, you know, how can AI and materials design uh, accelerate scale-up and commercialization of novel materials? Uh, are there particular directions that you see especially promising or examples you'd like to, to bring forward that you haven't already covered? Yeah, the, 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 the benefit, the main, in, in my view, the main benefit of AI uh, has to do with enabling uh, scientists and engineers to make 
uh, better, better informed, lower risk decisions. If you think about, uh, you know, at a place like 3M, Christina talked about this a bit, uh, the, you have teams of experts who are making large numbers of, um, technical decisions on a daily, weekly, annual basis. Uh, uh, and, and usually the, the right answer is not known a priori. Uh, these are, these are high risk, high uncertainty decisions in many cases. And the idea is that with data and AI, you can, uh, improve your odds of success, right? It's not a silver bullet. It doesn't get you the right answer every time either, mm-hmm. but you can make better informed decisions. You can have less uncertainty each time you make one of those, one of those bets. Uh, and of course those benefits accrue over time because very often the outputs of one decision feed in as the inputs to the next. Uh, and as a result, when people are making uh, better, higher, uh, you know, higher yield decisions, uh, R&D projects mature more quickly, scale up failures are less common and products get to market faster. Okay, well, thank you. Um, uh, now a question for, for Nicola. Um, you know, we've heard a lot about AI and, and simulation, um, but there are also, uh, you know, fascinating developments uh, underway in the fields of computer vision, automation, and uh, edge computing. Um, what do you see as particularly promising in those fields, and how, how might we be able to combine them with the AI methods? So, uh, well, Christina made my job a lot easier because she covered a bunch of these topics. Um, she might not have, she used IoT, which is related to Edge, but um, there's some really exciting developments. I mean, there's, you know, a lot of these um, software frameworks are out there that uh, bring the tools more accessible to the community. And I think Bryce talked and Christina both talked about sharing and the, you know, sharing of software tools, AI models. And then there's some new, pretty exciting, um, you know, hardware that accelerates the AI that allows us to actually put the devices at the edge. So, you know, right there in the manufacturing facility where you gain low, you know, you have low latency, you have uh, low bandwidth, possibly um, you keep your data private. You don't have to ship it up to the cloud or somewhere for computing. And, you know, a lot of these ideas, Christina talked about some of the things that 3M, like, you know, visual inspection has been around for decades. And um, now you have the ability to quickly develop and deploy uh, models that will work in, you know, much more complicated um, or complex environments. You know, they're more, you have more robustness to noise and lighting. You're more quickly able to adapt uh, and be more flexible. And so there's some overhead to using AI. but I think that, you know, it's going to bring a lot of strengths that, you know, as Bryce said, you, you know, you add a lot more knowledge, uh, with, um, a low bar to entry. So, you know, I view it in computer vision as a, you know, we, we like to call them software defined sensors. You have to build a sensor or detector for everything you anticipate. That's, that's not really feasible economically or in engineering, but, you know, with computer vision and AI, you can actually do this uh, and, you know, push that uh, algorithm out to the edge and have it work in your factory. And I think that's a pretty exciting opportunity. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, now I, I'd like to, to move on to, to Kathleen. Um, so, and, and I have a slightly different question to pose here. So, you know, we heard from Bryce and I guess also from Nicola about uh, AI helping uh, you know scientists and engineers to make better decisions um, but there's also another perhaps you know, complementary uh, dimension here um, in which we seek to build uh, you know self-driving labs that labs that can operate entirely um, autonomously uh, based perhaps on just high level goals provided by uh, scientists engineers uh, managers um, what do you think is the you know, the big promise of autonomous systems in the areas we're talking here. Do you see manufacturing uh, in industries such as yours adopting AI-enabled autonomous systems? Um, and, you know, where do you think those systems are most likely to be applied uh, effectively? Yeah, sure. Uh, and I think it ties back to a lot of the stuff that the previous panelists have already uh, mentioned. And First of all, thanks so much for the uh, invite. Sorry about missing the uh, opening remarks. It's a little hard to get off mute real quick. But, um, you know, I definitely, I you know, there's been work going on in AI-guided materials discovery for, for a number of years. We've seen stuff come out of 
MIT out of Toronto, um, looking at things like automated chemical synthesis, where people are using robots to mix compounds in certain ratios, a uh, system that can do rapid high throughput testing and characterization, generate data, feedback to a machine learning system, and then iterate until you get to a compound with some uh, specific problem or properties. I, you know, I think that is going to be important to industry or technologies like that are going to be important to industry. The problem that we see um, is scale up. And, and when I say important to industry, I think specifically um, as we look at it, you know, looking at one of those first applications being, of course, additive manufacturing. Um, but of course, on an industrial level, uh, in an engineering sense, we need to do additional testing and processing. Um, some of those tests and processes are quite complex, perhaps not well defined. Um, you're still needing uh, subject matter experts in the loop. But we've seen national labs, especially Argon, starting to scale to, you know, as I think was mentioned before, hundreds of kilograms of materials uh, throughout processing. This is helping uh, to do automated experimentation to funnel down to those good candidates. Um, again, still challenges to scale up, but that looks um, looks really promising. Industrial-wise, you know, looking at this specific to the area of additive manufacturing, um, in particular, you know, being able to take the perspective of design for additive, um, you know, also thinking about the ways that AI can help us not just to identify the materials that will work better with additive manufacturing, but also feedback data all the way from the product side to optimize the system from the materials through the manufacturing to the product. And, you know, just sort of thinking through that. Um, I think in addition, you know, the same challenges or approaches apply when thinking about adopting AI enabled autonomous systems um, to, you know, that, that apply to using AI for additive manufacturing in general. Um, you've got to get the data, and uh, we've already heard a little bit about that, but we need really a digital infrastructure that allows us to do that sensing at that high resolution, but we need it to make sense in a factory setting. So looking at, you know, again, how do we get there um, using national lab infrastructure, the sensing and the communication capabilities that exist there, exist there, um, Sorry, uh, to be able to standardize uh, some of these processes uh, would be very helpful. We also have to use the data. Thanks. We talked already a lot about that. Um, quantification and certification, which lead us to be able to standardize things. Just being able to uh, get to the point where we can uh, see the same thing in the laboratory uh, that or sorry, see the same thing in the factory that you guys see in the laboratory without needing that sensing and communication infrastructure. So how do we work with the national labs to be able to, um, to use some of this technology and processes that are nonlinear, under sense, um, time delayed, uh, like additive manufacturing. So back to your analogy about self-driving cars, you know, it, right there we're looking at online sensing and control we need a data infrastructure sensors are gathering tons of data very quickly we need a low latency infrastructure system obviously delays are a problem in the car side we're looking at you know obviously not getting into a crash here we're looking at not introducing a uh, fault into a part or a component so the analogy is really good right well thank you very much so so uh Actually, on, on that sort of pushing a bit forward further on that point, I'll ask uh, Christina a question. So, so you, you talked about the in, importance of uh, speed to market, you know, and and uh, velocity of innovation. So, have you got have you got comments you could share with the audience about how private partners, private public partnerships, can be used to accelerate um, you know, the delivery of, of new products? You know, Ian, that's really a perfect question for me because that's my job. No, that's part of my job. I'd say global R&D services uh, leader at 3M, but, but also because that's a passion, <laughs> a passion of mine. Um, uh, really creating these collaborative ecosystems in which, and I call it the triangle, in which uh, the government, the government agencies, institutions, national labs, 
together with universities and industry is powerful. It's powerful. Each one of us has his own uh, task and responsibility, but frankly, it's powerful. And, and it's not easy sometimes to set them up because they are competitive and intellectual property and there are other concerns. And it takes uh, champions, both sides, in the national lab and in the industry to make that happen. But I, I put the two examples that we have, the two creators that we have, yep. that really we together have advanced the, the technology, the science, but together have benefited too. You know, this um, uh, 3M, 3M would not have had the time of investing in the algorithms uh, that Marcos has been doing in the things that Ben has been doing to really create that infrastructure, how we send data from one place to the other, how do we manage it, how do we do things like that. Um, a, a tremendous benefit. Uh, the National Lab benefits because they're actually doing a practical problem. They are actually learning, understanding, and living the constraints that we face in, the, in, in industry the parameters that we can and we cannot work, the spaces that we can access or not. It's not a mathematical exercise anymore. It's a, wow, no, I cannot get to that condition that you're talking about. And frankly, uh, the, the exchanges, the discussions between the scientists in, in Argonne, in this case, and our scientists and engineers, um, that insight that have come from those discussions have been precious. I'm excited about those 10,000s of DOEs that we could not have done on our own. I, I, I like that uh, both Nicola and Christine referred to the infrastructure, the high performance computing infrastructure that you have, but that's precious. I also think that the partnership goes beyond, you know, the development. It goes into education too. And that's what I highlighted, Chai Mad. And that's why, you know, we've also partnered with boot camps to bring boot camps into, into 3M uh, with the Nano Center, uh, at University of Maryland sponsored by NIST, because those, uh, uh, those things are essential. Thanks, uh, Ian. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. So, um, so thanks for all those, uh, those answers. We now we we get we have a, a good number of interesting questions from the audience, uh, and I encourage others to to add add further questions while we're t talking. Um, but let me uh, start with with one. Actually, I'm I'm going to combine two in, into sort of a, a single because I think they're related to similar themes. Um, you know, so a couple of uh, people asked the following. You know, we've heard about some uh, wonderful. Uh, case studies uh, of successful uh, application of uh, AI techniques. Um, so then, you know, for people in the audience who are interested in, in, in doing similar things, uh, two related questions. One is, you know, how, how do you deal with uh, the sort of cultural change uh, and perhaps uh, sometimes resistance that you may encounter to these new methods uh, in in uh, you know in in, in industrial uh, settings, uh, and then secondly, how, how do you what should you be doing to prepare uh, for uh, the deployment of these mechanisms? Do you start with small projects? Do you start with uh, you know large uh, initiatives? Um, uh, there are things like digitizing all of your old data that should be undertaken uh, early in the process. Anyway, so any any of you or all of you who'd like to respond to those two related questions of cultural change and technical preparation, uh, let's see what you might uh, like to tell us. I, I can comment on the on the um, cultural change piece briefly, uh, and I think this is a, an area and several other. Uh, speakers mentioned this uh, as well, um, where it's really essential to focus on combining data and AI with the subject matter expertise, with the domain experts. Uh, you know, if you think about places like like 3M or Raytheon, right? There, there are there are many many uh, people with decades of experience, um, which isn't easily reduced to a spreadsheet that could be used to train a machine learning algorithm. Uh, but uh, that that kind of deep domain knowledge, in our experience at least, is highly complementary to what data and AI are good at, which is 
um, looking across many different data silos, crunching a lot of data uh, very, very quickly, uh, shortlisting a billion alloy recipes or synthesis routes to 10 that the domain expert then can think about uh, using the additional knowledge that he or she has. So in terms of um, positioning, let's say, adoption of materials informatics to an organization, I think it's very, very important to, to um, address up front the fact that some people are going to have the concern that, hey, is this, are you trying to replace me with AI? Uh, and, and I think that that's a sort of, to say you're either doing physics or you're doing AI is, is a false dichotomy. You can do both. You can, you can and you should do both. And you need to combine um, AI with domain knowledge to be most effective. Yeah, I agree completely. And I think, too, it's, you know, it's it's not as analytical, maybe, as, as those of us who are engineers and mathematicians would like it to be. But simply starting out by finding those people who are machine learning and AI experts who are passionate about physics and finding those physicists and material science who are passionate about the other side and putting them together. And there is it. it and after a couple of years, honestly, in a conversation, you can't hardly tell who is who because that learning has taken place at such a deep level. So, and, and I think it's, you know, to the second part of the question as well, how do you start? At least for us, I think you, you know, from a research community, industrial research perspective, you start small um, with small groups of people who want to work together on some of those problems, show the impact um, and grow from there. I would comment on one of the projects I work on. Oh, sorry. One of the projects sorry. I work on actually have a, a parallel data path where we're piggybacking on our partners. We're pulling off all their data to do our edge computing and our without interrupting their current workflow. Uh, with the goal of after you know we get up and running, showing them that you know what we can do and how it strengthens without interrupting their current processes. So there are, there are mechanisms in the infrastructure where you can uh, make inroads. Uh, for the cultural piece, you know, there's a lot of research going on uh, in the AI community, you know, the explainable AI and other tools. And again, with another uh, partner that I work with, this is in the medical imaging domain, but it's imaging, um, you know, developing tools that say, this is why the decision is outputting this response. And so having, um, you know, some feedback to the user, you don't want, you know, they don't want the AI black box saying, yes, this person has a tumor or not. They, they want to know what made that decision. And so there is a lot of research in that area right now. It is not mature, but it is, it's coming online. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, to me, to me also, Ian, this is Christina. It's um, as, as we try to build that ecosystem together, that we're collaborating with you, that we are, you know, uh, being part of this uh, uh, AI acceleration. It's also having those exploratory projects that, you know, together we were able to show, boy, this is going in the right direction without a lot of having to agree to a big project. But the projects have to be relevant, and the insight that is given has to be uh, used for design. It's not for a pretty picture. It's for something relevant that impacts and makes a, that expert go to a next level that they were not. And when you do that, when you empower them, that expert, uh, that mm -hmm. domain expert to do more things, boy, they are in. They are totally in. Right, and the trick is finding that thing uh, that's in, in the first place. Okay, great answer. So um, let me move on to a, a slightly different uh, question. Um, and well, apologies, I'm not crediting the questioners, but uh, lots of good people asking questions here. Um, so this is a, again a fairly broad question, but how does U.S. manufacturing, I guess, in particular, um, any thoughts on how it compares with the rest of the world in applying AI and ML uh, methods. And the question was specifically about uh, additive and subtractive manufacturing, but you know, you might, some of you might like to respond in, in different areas as well. Are we ahead, are we behind? What do we, if we're behind, what should we be doing to, to catch up? I think you may have some other experts to do that, but I'm gonna share what we're doing in 3M. We have laboratories in Europe and in China and in Japan that are 
um, capable, as capable as we are, and we are just distributing the work as similar. So I see capabilities and ability to to contribute from all those centers. Um, that's kind of my my thoughts on this. Okay. So, uh, I, I don't. Uh, manufacturing. You know, I work with folks in Japan, and they're they're kind of on par with what we're doing in in some other application areas. We're looking at solar facilities and. I, I see everyone's um, hopping on the bandwagon, and um, I, I see more as collaborative than competitive. I don't really see any uh, country surging ahead, but uh, maybe we are. I don't know. Okay, good. Let's let's get let's get yet more philosophical for a moment and ask. Um, Let's imagine, it, so I'm sure it's just a couple of years and, and all the physics phenomena known to science will be incorporated in our machines. Um, what will the role be for for, uh, for humans? Um, what will we, looking more positively, what are the, what, what will researchers, uh, engineers do in the future that will be different than what they do, do today? What, once we have these uh, very powerful, uh, intelligent uh, management systems they will be solving bigger problems you know we we talk about sustainability today huh? we need the humans to solve the problems the sustainability problem um at 3m we we talk about science of climate science of circular science of social of community and they are big problems these are the, 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 the extension of machine learning, the way we're talking about, that's, that's here. But, but these other problems need that, um, that human that you're talking about. Yeah, I think, I think scientists are going to be spending uh, more time on the fun parts of their job, frankly. I think they're going to be spending more time uh, uh, coming up with new ideas. Uh, I think they're uh, going to get feedback on those ideas faster than has ever been possible before. Um, the, the reality is this critical step of hypothesis generation. I, I know, there, of course, there's optimism that AI can help us do that, but I really think that some of the bedrock aspects of the scientific method, the scientific process, um, are, 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 are difficult to sort of entirely move into the digital realm, and, and, and that's where the sort of human AI um, uh, sort of symbiosis can be very, can be, uh, very potent. Yeah, I've seen uh, it's, it's said. I've seen it said that uh, you know AI ML skills themselves are actually being automated quite quickly. Uh, so, but the skills that seem harder to uh, automate are those that require deep understanding of the physical systems that you're you're trying to manipulate, which is interesting. I think someone else was going to talk, and I interrupted. No, I was. Just was gonna say, I think yeah. if the question yeah. is. What do we do when all technical problems can be solved by computers? Um, I, I, I mean, that's a very philosophical question, but I would say it's probably not a problem for my grandchildren even, but I'd love to see it. I mean, there's plenty of other non-technical problems that humans need to solve, so that'd be, that'd be a wonderful outcome. I So, um, and here's a, another question that actually also appeals uh, to, to me. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about uh, AI methods, um, but uh, you know, the, we also uh, understand that the core to the success of many of these methods is is data. Um, you know, are there? To what extent do, do you think uh, is Data collection of data is something that individual companies should be competing on, uh, or should they be collaborating with others? Um, you know, do you think companies are putting enough effort internally into acquiring the data um, that they need for a successful AI? I mean, I think there's a set of questions around there that you might, that some of you might have some thoughts on. No? 
I would imagine I think data, I'll just make a brief, brief comment, which is that uh, I, I think data and AI, you know, let's say well-vetted AI-based models are going to be core, increasingly viewed as core IP and core competitive differ differentiation for, for companies going forward. So yeah, people should protect their data and not share it with others. Is that, would that be your? Well, I, I think, you know, hopefully there's the opportunity, for example, for ongoing public-private partnerships based around pre-competitive yeah. data, for instance. But clearly there's always going to be large chunks of data and know-how that are going to remain proprietary. Uh, and, and I would say, if anything, the, the value of those and the direct translation of those into competitive advantage, into, you know, speed to market, that's going to become a, a very straight line yeah. um, going forward. Mm -hmm. You know, I also think, Ian, this, Christina, that, that we all in this journey of AI, machine learning, data science, have come to realize that the data is not sitting there easily wrapped. Right. Huh? It's not, you know, I, I, that's something that I do think it's a role for, for these communities. How do we do the infrastructure that is required for data collection, data uh, use, the data lakes, all of that? I, I make it easy for me. I'm a chemical engineer. I want to do this. I don't want to have to be doing that sort of thing. So there is that. But you know, in my journey as a leader, as we digitize processes in R&D, boy, the data security is key. These, these rules about who can access and who cannot access, for me, that's important, even internally, even internally. And the second thing is the data quality. You don't know how much time we, sp we spend in data cleansing. Cleaning, who likes to clean? <laughs> but really, so those are also two very important things that uh, we need to make easier. All data would be difficult to access. Yeah, I heard it said that 90% of a data scientist's time is spent cleaning data, and the other 10% is spent complaining about cleaning data. So that's okay. So I um, guess I mean that one percent. I don't know how we're doing. I'm complaining. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but here's a another related question, which uh, was posed by by someone. So, you know, uh, th there are data resources uh, that have been produced, uh, some of public, and of course some in internal. Um, but they're often uh, sort of ideal, idealized systems. You know, they people have measured some specific quantity. Uh, with uh, great care for a range of uh, materials, for example. But, you know, in a, in a real engineering environment, you have these complex end-to-end -end -to -end workflows uh, that involve much more than just the, the these sort of idealized systems. Um, are there particular approaches that people should be thinking about when they work to bridge the gap between the idealized world of simple AI, you know, like computer vision and the real problems that arise in engineering uh, environments. The we questions must be getting of... harder. Well, maybe maybe our panelists of... are getting tired. No, no I, 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 great question. Sorry, go ahead, Kathleen. Oh, no, sorry. I, 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 you know, a lot of talk about what are the models that we use um, to build these systems to operate them. Um, you know, how can we simplify that? How can we um, how can we make something that works in the lab with all of the infrastructure and all of the the perfection that happens there, and then translate that to something that works in a factory environment? And um, you know, I I think that's it's probably thirty to forty percent of of what my team thinks about when they think about this stuff is is exactly how do you do that and how do you create models that that work both at that ideal level, but then can be scaled down and simplified to still give you the right outcomes at a, yeah. Yep, yeah. okay, interesting, yeah. I think uh, going back to this idea of, um, of uh, AI machine learning as glue, uh, it can be very constructive to uh, train AI models, for example, to learn the, the difference, the delta between some idealized, let's say, model of a single material system, uh, like let's say uh, density functional calculations, and the sort of much less ideal, messier real-world environment of a manufacturing setting, for instance. Um, that, that's a very, that's another nice example of domain knowledge getting you part of the way there, established physics getting you part of the way there, and then using AI as 
sort of the, the, the bridge or the glue that helps learn some of these non-idealities that allow you to then make predictions for the things you really care about. Nicola, you uh, wanted well, to say something? Something along the lines that, right, and, you know, I think the data collection and, yeah. and documenting it to be ready, but actually hopping back a little bit when we were talking about data and security and privacy and, and companies keeping their data, I would say a lot of the reason we are where we are in AI right now is because of the computer science community, and we take a very different view. We share. And a lot of the machine learning that is going on right now is because we shared. We shared our software. We shared our data. A lot of the network, neural network work came out of the computer vision community, and we go back decades of sharing. I mean, people used to set up websites where people could upload their code with, you know, whatever state it was in. This is pre, you know, having anything nice like GitHub. And a lot of the progress is made because of sharing. And so if everyone hoards their data and, and their models, it, it, it does uh, delay progress globally. It may help your uh, corporation. And I'm not sh saying everyone has to share everything, but I want people to reflect on we're here where we are now with AI because of a community that believed in sharing. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's I'm interesting. Go ahead. Yeah, it, it's Christine. a very good point what you just said, Nicola, and that, that's actually the role, I think. This this community, these national labs have, have played and can continue to play, is create those safe spaces where we can do that, that uh, sort of thing. And teach the rest of us that by sharing, sometimes you get much faster. And an example is the pandemic. The pandemic, the way we, industry, governments, university, have come together in a fast way and collaborate. Perhaps we have time for uh, just one more question and then and then some uh, perhaps you may some of you may want to have some closing remarks where you can make wild assertions without the chance for anyone to respond <laughs> to them. Um, well here here's a, a question which is more technical. Um, as we're starting to, you know, looking at using AI to uh, optimize manufacturing processes, what's the pro predominant or you know the most promising uh, machine learning algorithms that you see used for that purpose? Is it reinforcement learning? Um, you know, other other approaches. Do you see people using reinforcement learning in, in practice? It obviously works well in in uh, fairly, you know, more lab settings. No answer to that, perhaps. I, I, I think, um, you know, from my perspective, uh, there's usually not sort of one one algorithm or one approach that's right for for uh, every problem or even a large number of different problems. It's very can be very problem specific. That said, uh, you know, because a lot of times people will say, oh, you know, are you using neural net or random forest or SVM or, or whatever. Um, I, I think um, uh, that can sometimes be less impactful than general capabilities uh, of your method of choice. For example, can you do uncertainty quantification? Um, can you incorporate uh, known physics or domain knowledge in some way that's uh, uh, that's meaningful? Th those, I think, those knobs, those levers, it just in my view, are can be can be more um, yep. uh, meaningful for success than than the details of the algorithm itself. Mm -hmm. Yep. That does seem to be often the case. People get good results because they understand the problem as much as because they're using the the, the most modern method. Yeah, exactly. So, um, I mean, we're, I think we're we're close to the end of our our time. Uh, we ran a little bit long, in fact, because we had such uh, interesting questions from our audience. Um, to, as I give each of you an opportunity to. Tell us something, uh, make some concluding remarks. Is there something you'd like uh, the audience to remember going forward? Um, I could go around in order. So, I don't know, Christina, um, you're, you're free to pass. You can yes. yield your time to your colleagues. But You know, you, you started at the beginning with let's put science to work. Huh? I think uh, Christine had let's put science to work. Let's put AI to work. I think... Uh, we will all benefit. So let's continue in this journey.
and we'll learn a lot along that along the way. Yes, yeah. indeed. Uh, Bryce. Well, first, I, I uh, thank uh, Argon and the organizers um, and, and my esteemed fellow panelists. It, it's uh, great to be part of this discussion. Uh, and um, I, I would just reiterate the idea of um, combining uh, do domain knowledge, domain experts with uh, with data and, and AI. I think that's uh, the key to success. And um, you know, we at least just, uh, from Citrine standpoint, we think about how can we build software that makes world experts even more effective at what they do. Uh, so that's a, obviously a very, very high bar, <laughs> but I think that's the right mindset to have uh, when developing these tools. Yeah. Uh, Kathleen? So, um, you know, obviously, thank you. It's been uh, really enjoyable to participate in the panel and, and get to hear from all of you and the wonderful questions. I guess my, my closing point is you know, these technologies are more and more relevant to industry. Um, as we are able to scale the manufacturing process more and more. So I see the, the public-private partnership um, and the ability of us to use that capability and infrastructure at the national labs to create technology to enable us to scale uh, some of this stuff is really key to you know, the bridge from science to, uh, to technical reality in a factory setting. So, I'm um, really looking forward to working with you guys more in the future. And Nicola, last but not least, uh, any? I was say, after all of those, there's not much left. <laughs> uh, but I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll reiterate that I agree with all of the above. I think the collective efforts of all of us, industry, lab, is, is going to be a lot of fun. Um, I personally think that working on real problems, I think Christina's example of the pandemic made us all come together. If we all come together to say we're going to scale up manufacturing, you know, it, it could be pretty powerful. So um, I should probably have just stopped with Bryce, Meredith and Kathleen and Christina. Um, no, it's, I, I think that's a great point, though, you know, that we forget the national labs were sometimes we forget they were originally created to solve national problems, you know, of of great importance, and and I, you know, this is is certainly an opportunity to do that. So so I'll, I'll finish just by saying, you know, thanks uh, to all four panelists. Um, it's great to have you here. I, you know, to take your very valuable time. Um, I'm sorry you couldn't be here in person. Um, on the other hand, if you'd come in person, you'd probably now be snowed in at O'Hare uh, Airport. Um, <laughs> so you're probably glad not to have uh, made the trip. Uh, thanks also to the audience for the excellent uh, questions and for staying and listening. Um, I'm not sure what happens now. I think I may hand things back to uh, Shantanu. Is that correct? Yep. Uh, thank you, Ian. Okay. Uh, thank you, the panelists, and great questions uh, from the audience. As uh, Christina said, uh, let's create some safe space where we can innovate. We can come up with new algorithms. And uh, looking forward to how to make uh, AI to work and how to make science work. For this, partnerships are important. So our next speaker is Paulina Richenkova, who specializes uh, in science and technology partnership and out outreach at Argonne. Uh, Paulina fo focuses on maximizing outcomes from collaborations and how to develop new collaboration with Argonne. As our leaders and scientists and researchers would like to work with you, I am pleased to welcome Paulina to this webinar uh, to tell us uh, how people in the audience, uh, in different groups of people, can work with Argon and help us uh, move forward in this domain. Thank you, Paulina. Thank you, Shantanu. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paulina Ruchinkova, and I'm a business development executive and the Science and Technology Partnerships and Outreach Director at Argon. It is my pleasure to be here with you today. I found the discussion we just heard on leveraging AI to accelerate scale up of materials manufacturing processes fascinating. And as you heard throughout the event, at Argonne, we're partnering with leading materials manufacturing companies to help them ex explore the lab's unique um, expertise and facilities. With that in mind, I'd like to talk a little bit about Argonne's collaborations with industry and our approach to technology transfer and partnerships. Argon has a long uh, next slide, please. Argon has a long history of successfully working with industry through partnerships that enable pivotal discoveries, advance promising technologies, 
and deliver value for our partners. These partnerships typically come in one of three forms. One is collaborative research and development, or R&D, which generally includes a cost-sharing component from our partners. Two is R&D conducted solely by Argon for a company and sponsored by that company. And three, transfer of Argon develops technologies to companies in which the companies license the inventions from Argon to pursue commercialization. Argon collaborates with companies of all sizes, as you can see from, um, the, from the numerous logos on this slide, from fledgling startups to Fortune 500 multinational conglomerates. There are also unique DOE-sponsored programs that encourage collaborations between national labs, such as Argonne, and companies on specific topics. As you've heard earlier from Christine Chalk, uh, there, there are specifically DOE-sponsored programs from the Advanced Manufacturing Office, such as High Performance Computing for Energy Innovations Program, or HPC for EI. And for this program, um, this program leverages the National Lab's unique high-performance computing facilities and AI expertise to address specific manufacturing challenges that companies may be experiencing. As you heard earlier today, Christina Thomas from 3M mentioned that 3M partnered with Argon under this HPC for EI program to apply machine learning and simulation approach to nanowoven materials manufacturing. Another example is Argonne's collaboration with a company called Elementum 3D, a small company in Colorado. Also under this HPC for EI program, we partnered with Elementum 3D and are, and are applying multimodal modeling to explore energy efficient manufacturing of aluminum alloys. Our user facilities, the Advanced Photon Source and the Argon Leadership Computing Facility, can be accessed by industry researchers. If the research that will be conducted is open science, then access to these facilities is free of charge. Um, if the research that the company uh, plans to perform will be kept proprietary, access can be obtained as part of a collaborative research and development agreement. Argon also works with small businesses for a variety of mechanisms, uh, in particular small businesses that have received federal grants, such as SBIR grants or small business vouchers. Those are just a few examples of the types of mutually beneficial partnerships we engage in with industry. From the Department of Energy and Argon's perspective, it's part of our mission to ensure that U.S. companies have access to our cutting edge expertise facilities, tools, and intellectual property. For the U.S. companies, this type of collaboration opens new doors and helps them better compete globally. If you are interested in exploring how your company, whether large or small, might collaborate with Argonne, uh, then um, we propose that you reach out to our organization. I'm part of the Science and Technology Partnerships and Outreach Directorate, and uh, in my organization, we have experts on staff to help you consider what's possible and what might make most sense for your company. These professionals have both technical know-how and business acumen and are well-equipped to assist you make some determinations. A good first step is to visit the Argonne's website, where you can learn more about our materials, manufacturing, and computing capabilities and facilities. From there, you can contact the email address that's displayed here on the slide, manufacturing at anl.gov, so we can connect you with the right people or groups at Argonne to facilitate a conversation. If you do decide to work with Argonne, I or one of my colleagues will remain engaged in all stages of the collaboration lifecycle. Thank you for the opportunity to be part of today's event. At Argon, we witness every day how collaboration unlocks innovation, and that certainly applies to our work with industry. With that, I will hand it over back to um, Shantanu, and we hope that you can remain and join us with the virtual tours of Argon's manufacturing and computing facilities. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline.
that's a great uh, introduction to how you can work with Argon and uh, contact us as we go forward. Now we start the best part, actually, uh, if you are not already enjoying a lot. This is the part where we go to the virtual tour, we open our doors, and show you how we work. Uh, in this, uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, our uh, guided tours. Uh, first, uh, we'll hear from Devin Powers. Uh, he's a chemical engineer. He will be an advanced photon source. We'll show you that how we can use the power of X-ray scattering um, to optimize the processes of electrospinning. Uh, next, uh, we'll go to David Martin in Argonne Leadership Computing Facility. He will show us our latest and greatest computers uh, that you can use to make science work and make put AI to work for scale-up. Uh, then we'll hear from Noah Paulson from our Materials Engineering Research Facility, or MRF. In this new expanded MRF facility, Noah will explain how you can manufacture um, nanoscale materials in kilogram quantities using flame spray pyrolysis and use AI to accelerate the process. And finally, uh, we'll uh, go back to leadership computing facility uh, with Joe Inslee to look at the visualization capabilities that how we can integrate all the data coming from APS, MRF, and, and wonderful modeling simulation done on our petascale and soon to be exascale systems. So this is a one of a kind tour. Uh, so I hope that you will enjoy it. And if you have any question, uh, keep posting them. I will ask uh, the presenter uh, those questions uh, and would, would be happy to answer them afterwards. Now let's go get started. Um, first, uh, let's go to Devin in APS. Hi. I'm Devin Powers, a chemical engineering postdoc in the Applied Materials Division here at Argonne National Lab. I'm in the, uh, I'm in the Advanced Photon Source, where we use, uh, where we use the APS's XR capabilities to, to improve how we electrospin. A word on electrospinning. It's a process that allows us to make polymer fibers with submicron uh, diameters. The way that it works is that we take a polymer solution, uh, pump it through a needle set to a high voltage relative to a grounded target. Now, that target is typically a piece of metal, say a drum or a metal sheet. The voltage difference between the needle and, and, the tar and the target or collector creates an electric field. And as the solution is pumped through the needle, that electric field will ideally overcome the surface tension of the solution and draw it into a jet. Given the right conditions, that jet will whip back and forth, narrowing in diameter and evaporating the, sol uh, the solvent. The result is a mat of dry polymer fibers that we would then remove from the target and then do the post-analysis uh, post on. Electric spinning is, is a uh, technique that can be used to uh, that can be used for a wide variety of applications. Uh, in the AMD, we use electric spinning to make uh, replaceable replaceable filters for N95 face masks, uh, solid state electrolytes for lithium ion batteries, electrodes for solid oxide fuel cells, chemical and biological sensors, water filtration applications, sensing applications. The list goes on. Uh, but one of the uh, challenges with electric spinning is that there are so many factors that can affect the morphology of your, of, of your material. Uh, the voltage matters, uh, your flow rate matters, your, uh, your needle diameter matters, the humidity matters, the temperature matters. Again, I could, I could keep going, but uh, what I want to emphasize here is that the electrospinning process can actually be really complicated. And navigating that wide parameter space can end up requiring a ton of experiments and a ton of time to figure out the best set of conditions to get good fibers. But by using the APS's capabilities, we're able to sift through all of that uh, much quicker. What we've got here in front of me is a custom-built electrospinning apparatus. Full disclosure, this isn't connected uh, because putting my hands this close to high voltage would be a bit of a no-no, uh, but it operates on the same principle. We would have polymer solution here in the syringes, and, and, and we're ready to spin. We would pump the solution through this tubing and to these needles. These needles, which are set to a high voltage, uh, would have the solution coming out of their tips, and the electric field will draw the solution and the resultant fibers to this mesh target. During the experiment, we'll be able to spin the fibers and immediately move the mesh into the path of the beam. What this means is that right as we electrospin, we can determine the, uh, this, uh, we can determine what the fiber morphology is, rather than having to create an entire map and remove it for the post processing. Uh, we, do, uh, we do this by taking this setup and putting it normally into the hatch. Uh, so, uh, so when we do this, we, uh, put, we move the fibers right into the path of the beam. We use small angle X-ray scattering or SATs 
to detect the fiber morphologies. As the, uh, as the beam is fired at, the, uh, at our electrical materials, uh, it'll scatter. And based on that scattering pattern, we can determine whether our materials are, uh, are good or bad or somewhere in the middle. Uh, we can determine their shape, their size, their, their, their numerical density, things that are important to us. Uh, however, uh, this can still take time. And so the utilization of artificial intelligence and machine learning can help us move through, through all of this data faster. What we've got here on the screen uh, is, uh, is a machine learning software that is, that is reading in uh, small longer x-ray scattering data uh, and, uh, and converting uh, and providing real-time uh, evaluation of, of the images. We're also using a UMAP technique to, uh, to essentially sort the data into different buckets, say good, uh, bad, or somewhere in the middle. By doing so, we can we can then create uh, we can then create a, a, a parameter space, uh, and based and based on the condition and the results, say whether or not uh, a material is good or bad. And we can and we can teach the software that that information, and then use it going forward to determine whether or not uh, a new a new experiment, a new set of conditions. Um, are giving us what, what we want. In the long term, we, uh, we would then use the software to, uh, to fine tune the electric spinning experiment as, as it's going. So as we're making the fibers, the software would tell us whether or not our material is good and would automatically make the adjustments to the electric spinning uh, process to improve the morphology. Uh, this would speed up the experimental uh, process and let us get to a good set of conditions even faster. Once we get to a good set of conditions, we can then take those conditions and apply them to our roll-to-roll -roll electric spinning setup in the Materials Engineering Research Facility, uh, the MERV. When we do that, uh, the, uh, the system is gonna increase a little bit in complexity. Rather than two needles on this setup, uh, the the roll-to-roll -roll unit has 56 uh, nozzles, uh, which means that conditions that we find here might shift a little bit, but, util but the utilization of AI at least offers us a head start. We're, we'll be able to sift through conditions. We'll be able to figure out what set of conditions stand the best chance of giving us something good and immediately take those to our, to our scale-up scale -up unit uh, and, and continue to make larger batches of material. Uh, this is just another way that we're putting uh, science back to work for us. Thanks for listening. Thank you, David. Uh, as he was indicating, our scale-up facility uh, is, is in the MRF. Uh, in the APS, we get amazing amount of information, but that can guide us uh, to our larger scale 56 nozzle instrument, which is a roll-to-roll -roll instrument uh, to make materials like for the N95 mask. And uh, APS can guide design of experiments that saves energy, that saves materials wasted in trial and error. And that's uh, the part uh, that we show next uh, when Devin uh, is in MRF. Uh, can, you can play it next. As I mentioned at the APS, once we find a set of conditions that produce well-formed nanofibers based on small angle X-ray scattering results, we can transfer the recipe and conditions to the roll-to-roll -roll electrospinner. In this case, rather than a single needle, we control several arrays of nozzles to fabricate nanofibers. Each array, or bar, of nozzles has independent voltage and flow rate control. This offers both experimental and production benefits. For example, we can simultaneously try different conditions for a particular recipe, which allows for faster coverage of the experimental space, but we can also ramp up our production rate to obtain more fibers. Rather than a flat needle tip, the nozzles have a recessed opening leading to a buildup of solution at the tips. This can result in jets with a larger diameter, and in some cases, multiple jets, which erupt from the solution. In addition, the positioning of so many jets in close proximity can lead to interference, making proper optimization that much more important. What we see right now is the formation of the polymer jets that I've been mentioning. The electric field pulls the polymer solution from the tip of the nozzle into a thin jet. A few centimeters above the nozzle, the jet begins to whip violently, and as it travels toward the grounded collector, it narrows and the solvent evaporates. Using the APS results as a starting point, we're able to target a parameter space that should give decent results, then fine-tune the conditions based on post-analysis of our fibers. 
but the utilization of artificial intelligence can remove the guesswork from the process. Rather than casting a wide net, we can target conditions, both the machine parameters, such as voltage, working distance, and so on, and the solution parameters, such as concentration, viscosity, or solvent, that will allow for well-formed nanofibers. Furthermore, the utilization of artificial intelligence combined with the supercomputing capabilities here at Argon allows us to improve our conditions even faster. Back to you, Santanu. Excellent. There is, uh, you know, no exact questions for Devin, but I have one uh, for you, if Devin, uh, you can hear me. Um, and it's an ex ex excellent example you have shown, and, and you, you spend time uh, in, in APS and, and, and MRF, you make these wonderful samples. Um, where do you see going forward, AI can help you scale up even faster? And uh, we talked about the small angle excess scattering, but that may not be of the, all that we can do uh, for using AI. Where do you see, this, as an experimental researcher, your life uh, can be made easier if we integrate AI uh, into your life in, in planning experiments or uh, you know, uh, and, and making new advanced uh, samples? Uh, you can hear me, right? Okay. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to make sure. So. Um, we, uh, as I mentioned, we use electrospinning as a as a platform to make a bunch of different materials. Um, and so, where one of the places I see AI being being particularly useful is in giving us, you know, information before we start making our fibers. So, if we know that we want, um, for one hand, uh, on one hand, if we want fibers that have a certain morphology, a certain diameter, um, a certain uh, a certain aspect ratio. Uh, we can we can then fine tune the electric fitting process to get that. But even beyond that, if we know that we want a material that has certain properties, say we are making fuel cell electrodes where we are incorporating both polymer and catalyst, we can use AI to to figure out what the, what that composition should be. Um, that way, rather than you know spending a lot of time struggling to figure out what the best ratio between polymer and particle should be and figuring out the electric fittings for that, we we know we know ahead of time we want you know, X amount of polymer, Y amount of particles, and then also use AI to figure out what conditions will let us get there. That way we can jump straight to the, straight to the, you know, ideal um, recipe, straight to the ideal set of conditions, and then, you know, quickly jump into the testing phase to determine whether or not those, those conditions, those recipes are giving us something good, and quickly uh, reiterate so that we can go back and say, okay, this didn't work, we should adjust you know, this in this direction, this in that direction, um, to get to whatever, you know, ideal target we want. Um, uh, again, it's, it, it, it gets us back to that idea of being able to speed up the experimental process. Um, we can easily come up with a bunch of ideas, um, but, but all the time that we, that we spend trying to understand how to get there is time that's not spent actually testing the stuff. Antonu, you're muted. Hello? Try now. I just tried to unmute okay. you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Devin. <laughs> um, so thanks, uh, Devin. Um, now we go to David Martin in Argonne Leadership Computing Facility. Uh, this is where all the computing gets done, all the fun stuff, uh, numbers get crunched. Uh, so David uh, must be standing by uh, and should shortly be linking. Uh, over to you, David. Hello, welcome to the Argon Leadership Computing Facility. So I'm David Martin. I manage the Industrial Partnerships Program here. And on behalf of the more than 90 scientists, engineers, and staff, I want to welcome you virtually to our facility here. So in the next few minutes, we're going to walk around 
the data center and give you some of the idea of the scope and scale of what we do here. Uh, Christine did a nice job talking about uh, computing and the DOE facilities and user facilities. So this uh, ALCF is a user facility open to everybody. Um, it is a national resource, but we also have international users. We have a lot of people from other national laboratories, universities, uh, but my favorite users are the industry users because we help solve immediate problems and help uh, really help U.S. competitiveness and, and help the whole kind of computing ecosystem and industry grow. Um, so at ALC, if we do three things, we run these big machines and we'll walk around and see those. The second thing we do is help people use these machines because many of them are very esoteric and a little uh, hard to use initially. And then we're always working on the next generation of machines. Um, so if you follow me, we are going to walk around the corner here. So this machine that's behind me is Theta. So for some reason in computer science, people love to name their big machines. So all, all of our machines have names. Uh, this one, Theta, uh, is one of the world, world's largest supercomputers. It's based on Intel's nice landing architecture. Um, so the way that it works is there are lots of little cores that all look like kind of tiny PCs. Uh, this is, has 280,000 cores uh, spread out among about 4,400 nodes. Um, the way that we allocate it is people can, can ask for time and they can use anywhere from a few nodes up to the whole machine. And in fact, we encourage people to use the whole machine and do problems that can't be solved anywhere else. Um, there are people doing things like aircraft design, uh, new drug discovery, people in science doing astrophysics, uh, lots of work around material sciences. And the wide variety here gives our computational scientists a pretty wide breadth in how you can use systems uh, to solve all kinds of problems. So this system runs at about 12 petaflops at, at the theoretical peak. That's 12 quadrillion operations a second or 12 million billion. Um, so it is a very powerful machine. But I'll show you an addition to it here. So we're going to walk over here. So that's Theta. We're going to look at something we just installed this year. So Theta is a system that is, is using, you know, kind of traditional CPUs. So these white boxes here are Theta GPU. So this is an additional capability added onto Theta, funded some by the Club of Research Money, but now available to other people to help people use machine learning and uh, GPUs to solve problems you can't otherwise. And since almost doubles the computing power of data and allows us to do lots of stuff when we marry traditional simulation and uh, artificial intelligence. And while we're on the subject of artificial intelligence, I want to show you a, another machine that we, whoops, I think I walked right past it. Here we go. Another machine that, um, We've been using this is from a company called uh, Cerebrus, and this is a machine designed totally for AI. Uh, it has about 60,000 AI cores in there in a very tightly coupled way that allows us to do a lot of stuff around training and machine learning and data in, in new ways that we've never been able to do that before. Um, so this is just a couple of machines that are relevant to some of our AI work. Um, there are you know, dozens or so other machines that have other capabilities, but I wanted to show you a few other things here. In addition to the computing, we have a huge amount of storage. In fact, this is a new storage system that we put in recently. Um, there are 200 petabytes of storage, so you know, this is a, a massive amount of storage. And not only is it a large amount of storage, it is tied in at very high speeds for all the computers we were just looking at. So we can use data analysis, uh, lots of stuff about machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, and pull data off of here. And these are designed to support even our next generation of machines. In addition to that, we have a large amount of networking. So we are tied in to the Energy Sciences Network at 100 gigabits per second. And through that, the international networks is the corporate network. We're able to tie into um, other facilities. In fact, most of the people who use ALCF never physically come here. They can use everything remotely. Uh, this networking also gives us the capability to tie into physical facilities like the Advanced Photon Source with the Center for Nanoscale Materials 
It allows us to pull large amounts of data, uh, to help them in real time make decisions. And finally, it allows us to use some visualization stuff. It's pretty amazing. And Joe Hensley is going to talk about that next. Um, so one last thing before I let you go. If you happen to notice behind me during any of this talk, uh, a good bit of this room is construction area. And so this open space right behind me here is going to be a system called Polaris that will be coming in later this year. It will be about five times faster than the Theta supercomputer. And then behind those wooden walls over there, uh, we are building and uh, putting in place all the power and cooling for a new system called Aurora, which will appear in 2022, which will be about 100 times faster than our Theta system. Um, so lots of new toys and lots of opportunities to collaborate. So I'll stop the way I started mentioning the ALCF staff. We are here to work with you. Um, we are always happy to talk with you and I'll hand it back to the staff today. Oh, thank you, David. And for all the people in the audience who want to work with, reach out to David, reach out to us, and we'll get you uh, connected. Uh, the next stop uh, is our Materials Engineering Research Facility. Uh, so Noah Paulson uh, is standing by. Uh, let's see if he gets connected. Okay, uh, Noah, great seeing you. Uh, take it over. Can you hear me, Chantanu? Yes, I can. Great, thank you. Hi, my name is Noah Paulson. I'm a computational materials scientist in the Applied Materials Division of Argonne National Laboratory. I'm here in the MRF at the Flamespike Pyrolysis Reactor. As you can see to the left of me, it stretches from that end of the room all the way to the other. It's got a number of in-situ characterization tools that are attached to it, uh, and we'll be talking more about that in a bit. So what actually is Flamespike Pyrolysis? It's a manufacturing technique where we use a precursor solution that can contain both inorganic and organic uh, metal uh, precursors, and we can uh, pump that into a flame and collect the resulting material. So the resulting material can be used for a number of different technologically important applications that can range from catalysts to solid state lithium ion battery materials. So what's special about flame spray pyrolysis is that we can use it to produce these important materials in sometimes a single step. Here at the MRF, we can use it to produce kilogram scale and above a material, but our industrial collaborators can be used, can use it to produce even larger quantities of material. But there remain uh, some challenges uh, for phony spike pyrolysis, namely that there's a number of input variables that we need to account for, and the combustion process itself can be very complex. So we need to kind of address some of these challenges to produce high quality materials. So what's special about our flame spray pyrolysis setup here at the MRF is that we've got a number of in-situ characterization tools that we can use to both better understand the physics of what's going on in flame spray pyrolysis, but also to help uh, optimize the flame spray pyrolysis in situ uh, and in real time. So next I'm gonna be moving over to the slides. And we have here a schematic that shows really our workflow for machine learning uh, and connecting with the in situ characterization. So the first step here is to understand what we actually want to optimize. And that can be a number of different characteristics of the, the material. So it could be the particle size, particle morphology, phase fractions, compositions, and, and whatever else. Uh, but the first step actually is to define a set of experiments that we want to perform uh, that explore the different input variables and connect and collect the outputs. So we perform those experiments and collect a preliminary small data set. That's then fed into our machine learning techniques, um, namely Bayesian optimization. And that's a technique where we can collect that small data set and, and use it to predict uh, uh, or, or find the next optimal set of conditions to explore with, with flame spray pyrolysis. So once we collect that information, we can uh, suggest the next experiment to flame spray pyrolysis, run the experiment, collect the in-situ characterization results, and pass it back to the, the Bayesian optimization tool. So basically repeat that cycle and you can see it here, the this, this cycle we've, we've drawn in the schematic until we've satisfied our optimization objectives. So what we wanted to do here as a first step is to really control the particle size distribution and, and create a really uniform distribution of particles. So that's important because it, it's a, it, for, for the stability of those particles in their actual applications. And as an initial case study, we looked at silica nanomaterials production um, we had four input variables that, that ranged from concentration of the, the precursor solution to liquid flow rates and gas flow rates. Uh, and we've got the results that I'll show in the next slide. And as you can see, the relative spread, which is basically the standard deviation 
of the particle size distribution divided by its mean that we're measuring with our in-situ uh, scanning mobility particle sizer, uh, we can reduce that quantity pretty quickly throughout the course of about experimental runs. And that really gives us a lot of confidence that our techniques that we're using are gonna be able to be applicable to other technologically important materials. So we can not only look at the particle size distribution, but with other uh, phase fractions, phase compositions, uh, we have Raman spectroscopy and, and optical emission spectroscopy and other techniques as well. So this is a little bit of a different topic, uh, but it will, will, will bring it back. And basically what we're looking at here is a dashboard that's updated in real time with different sorts of uh, diagnostics and analyses and just a, you know, a typical information you'd see in flame spectroanalysis. On the top left, you can see uh, fluorescence imaging that, that highlights the droplets that are coming out of the nozzle in flame spectroanalysis. In the center, this is just a sort of a, a run of the mill parameter, the, the fan load, which is important though for safety. And then on the top right, we have uh, a real-time measured scanning mobility particle sizer particle size distribution, which was, was used for the optimization I showed before. But really what's happening here is we're taking these in-situ characterizations and diagnostic information from flame spike pyrolysis, and we're sending it uh, via high-speed network to our Argonne Leadership Computing Facility that we just looked at before. We're doing the processing with the machine learning uh, and with maybe uh, uh, simulations as well. And we're feeding that information back to the MRF and, and getting this diagnostic information. So one of the things that we might want to particularly look at would be the stability of the flame. And that's important because it controls, you know, how much contamination potentially there might be in the product material that you get out of flame spray, but also, uh, you know, how much uh, product you're wasting or how much might end up on the walls of the reactor uh, and, and have that has influence on the maintenance schedule as well. So what you're seeing here is actually a video of the flame. Uh, that we're taking, uh, not in real time now, but, but previously. And you can see that the flame is in the middle here. It's highlighted in a, a purple color, and that's because we have a, a CH radical filter that's, that's like bringing those sorts of characteristics out. Uh, but we really, what we did here was we developed a machine learning technique based on a region-based convolutional neural network. And you can see that we're highlighting different features of the flame. So in this yellow, we have the four uh, burners, the, the, the pilot flames. And you can see that we have a high probability of these being stable. And then in the center, we have the most important part, and this is the stability of the actual flame spray flame. And you can see that sometimes it says stable, sometimes it says unstable. It's because this is not really an ideal running condition we're looking at here. But this is really important for helping to, you know, interface with the optimization of the, the process and the automation of the process as well. So I hope that we've convinced you that there's really the value in, in, in coupling this in-situ characterization approaches with machine learning and, and other sort of data-driven approaches in, in accelerating the scale-up of, of um, uh, technologically important materials. So that's really all I have for you today. Thanks for your attention, and I think we're going back to Shantanu for questions. Oh, thanks so much, uh, Noah. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, not, not a whole lot of questions. I just wanted to ask you that as a researcher in AI, working in this labs, you know, working with the experimental researchers in, in the MRF, uh, what do you see is the promising aspect of where things are going and the future of AI and scale up? Uh, what's your perspective? Uh, I, I really wanted to know that what do you think is the next latest and greatest thing should be happening and you're excited about? Well, I mean, I think, one thing that's been really exciting for me is the development of these sorts of machine learning tools that can use very, very small data sets and learn as they go. So these, these so-called active learning approaches. And that on its own is, is you know, exciting, but it really only becomes useful when it's coupled with you know, these sorts of characterization techniques that we have that can really get at the heart of what we need in, in the materials. So it's the coupling between these new, ex these new machine learning as well as these high, you know, high-tech high experimental techniques that, that really will drive us towards these optimization objectives that we have for materials design and, and other applications. Excellent. Uh, thank you, and I thank you and your rest of the NRTO team, Maria Stan are the, and other people that were tremendously talented people at Argonne uh, who helped us uh, developing all these near real-time capabilities. Thank you, Noah, for presenting the work. Thanks, Shatanu. Uh, now, the last bit, uh, all this data, all this computing, you know, visualization is very powerful. Uh, because if you cannot really look at the complexity of the data 
and make AI a partner in data analytics and the massive amount of data can literally overwhelm you rather than being a power. So the, combined with AI and visualization, our visualization lab or Viz lab in Argonne is, is, is almost the best place to go. Uh, it's a fun place to visit. Uh, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm waiting for Joe Inslee to join us uh, from the Viz lab. Uh, let's see if we can connect. Oh, here is Joe. Hi. Hello. Hello. Can Hi. I can hear you. Okay, so, great. Uh, Take it away. Uh, great, thank you. So uh, my name is Joe Inslee. I'm the team lead for visualization and analysis uh, here at the Leadership Computing Facility. Um, and we're here now in our visualization lab, uh, which is just upstairs, a couple floors above uh, the data center where David showed you around a little bit earlier. And so as Santanu was saying that, that um, the, the large scale applications that run on our resources, as you know, generate large piles of data. And the best way to, to, to understand all that data is through visualization. And so that's where my team comes in. So we work for, with um, facility users um, from a wide range of, uh, of scientific domains. So for example, Here's um, examples of, of cosmology and, and astrophysics. Um, climate, of course, um, down at the bottom here is an example of nuclear engineering, um, blood flow through arteries in the brain. You can see a number of examples of uh, material science uh, type applications. And we also mentioned that in addition to academia and other national labs, we also work with uh, lots of um, industrial partners and so these are just a couple of examples, uh, a couple here from, from GE, looking at here, this is uh, airflow over an airfoil um, from a, a, a wind turbine, um, and then also looking at flow through a, a jet nozzle from, from an airplane. Um, down here, this is a, a, a project with Boeing, looking at uh, design for new types, uh, new designs for airplane wings. Um, uh, also, an example from Aramco, uh, looking at combustion engines um, and, and fuel spray within the engine. Um, and then, and again, there's a couple of uh, examples of, of more material uh, types of applications. I'll let Santanu talk a little bit more about those in a second. But one thing I wanted to point out, so everything that we've been looking at so far, these are all pre-rendered animations that we're playing back. but the, the large use for the, the best use for this facility um, is collaborative. And so we also use it for interactively exploring data uh, in real time. And so this is a, an image of, of, of myself and a couple of collaborators that are looking at data that was collected at the events, photon source. We, that data was transferred to uh, here to ALCF using our resources uh, to reconstruct the 3D model and then um, beyond that, also using the resources to run machine learning algorithms uh, that did segmentation and by identifying particular structures within the data. Um, and then we can take that data, uh, visualize it on our visualization cluster uh, down in the resource center and, and stream that up to, to the display and then interact and explore with that data in real time um, in order to, to, to gain additional insight from the data. Um, and then I'll also mention that, so most of this right now is, is being done um, post-processing after the simulation's already run, but as the disparity between the rate at which we're computing data and the rate at which we were able to save it continues to get larger, um, there's a lot of research in the community for doing in situ visualization and analysis. So while the data is still in memory before it gets written to disk, um, which enables you to get access to much more data than you would if you had you may end up having to throw some data out because you can't save it fast enough. Um, and then that, that also offers opportunities to potentially um, to uh, uh, do interactive exploration um, while the simulation is still running and feedback into that running simulation. And so with that, I'll, tell, I'll ask uh, David to take this image down and I'll turn it over to Santanu to, to explain about a couple of these other specific examples. Sure. Uh, thank you, Joe. A uh, couple of just final quick points that um, we wanted to make. Um, 
especially about the data and, and where things are going and just to bring the close the seminar with some examples uh, of uh, our AI and data science exp explanations. So these are the atomic scale model by the CNMs uh, team for tribologically complex fluids uh, that can reduce uh, friction. And this is molecular simulations at interfaces. You can look at atomistic detail and statistics and distance plots doesn't show you the amazing complexity of interfaces and materials and how it interacts uh, at, at, at the interfaces. So that's a one good example when we start at the really small scale materials data, uh, microstructures, evolution of microstructure as you go along. And you can learn from these simulations, which are physics based simulation, that what might be the ideal way to process materials and, and get to the complexity that we need uh, to get to the ideal materials. So we learn a lot from this scale. Uh, then uh, Joe talked about APS data. Uh, one of the example that Devin was showing is uh, about um, electro spinning. And we have recently <clears throat> worked on the N95 mask using the N9, uh, you know, electrospinning system that you saw at the MRF. This is APS Beamline 32 YDB uh, that does nano uh, tomography that can go through this non-oven materials that filters uh, COVID uh, out of the air uh, to, to make it an N95 standard. And you can collect this data you can walk through this data in a facility like visualization lab, and you can use AI to learn a lot about what you're getting right, what you can more optimize in your manufacturing process. So at Argon, so we can start with the manufacturing process of what Devin showed, generate materials, and train AI to actually generate this microstructure that's called generative adversarial networks uh, to actually make this microstructure. And this is a real data of real materials and then uh, analyze this using AI and in a facility uh, like VizLab. So um, the last example uh, I wanted to talk about is that we have this dashboard that you have seen uh, that Noah uh, showed about flame spray pyrolysis. So, so we can look at a lot of this in-situ data for near real-time feedback, great research done at Argon by researchers and uh, but at the same time, we can look at uh, you know inefficient combustion, bring machines to uh, you know actually combust things in a very laminar and stable way, flame stability. Uh, at the same time, you know there is much of more complex physics that is going on. As you go to more and more complex materials, you want to scale them up. You need to really understand the flame and turbulent flow really well. For that, uh, physics-based simulation using fluid dynamics methods especially large eddy simulations, it's called LES, can use the high performance uh, computing facility that we have. We have a couple of examples of the same flame spray flame that you show going on the left uh, that we can show uh, next. So this simulation is done by uh, Devalina Das Gupta and, and, and Sibin Dusom's team. So they are really experts in uh, simulating the fluid dynamics um, and they can really track uh, the turbulence. Uh, if we can, uh, I don't know if you can minimize this and get that uh, CFD of the oxygen streams out. Yeah, um, uh, no, it's a CFD data with the oxygen flow in the on the left side, I guess. Um, and there you can uh, find. So this is another dashboard, but there is another fluid dynamic simulation uh, buried behind it probably, that looks at oxygen flow streamlines and atomization dynamics that you see here. Uh, so this is the oxygen flow, the three-dimensional complex dispersion of in, in this flame spray that you just saw. And uh, this is done using high-performance computing. This is a swirling motion due to introduction uh, of, of oxygen through angled grooves and radially inward com components. And uh, the flow fields uh, aids the you know atomization, and so it is very important to understand the flow field inside uh, this uh, manufacturing environment uh, to understand scale up. Uh, there is another video probably of the atomization, uh, but the point uh, is that if you can connect the data from the instrument uh, and the simulation, and use the high performance computing at the petascale and above, and use machine learning to accelerate some of the simulation. We have a complete cycle where we see tremendous opportunity for accelerating scale up and AI. Uh, thank you all uh, for uh, from the from the Viz Lab, uh, and I will. Uh, I, this 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 brings us uh, to the end uh, of our uh, of our webinar. Uh, first of all, I appreciate uh, the audience for sticking around and looking at this wonderful work that is going on in Argon. 
Um, and uh, please uh, reach, reach out to us uh, at manufacturing at anl.gov. Uh, and thanks for attending plan for using uh, AI for accelerating scale up, using our experimental capabilities and computational capability and research in AI. Um, and this is a third in the webinar series. Another exciting webinar is coming in March. That is about our scale up expertise in helping to bring about the plastic upcycling and the circular economy. And this is one of the very major important challenge uh, for, for the society. And we're looking forward to this uh, next webinar uh, in the series on frontiers in materials manufacturing. Again, thank uh, all of you, the attendees and the Argon team, especially who makes this possible. All the video to planning, everything that goes into this. I thank you all. Uh, I thank you for joining us today. We would see you soon in our next webinar. Thank you.